phony humanitarianism. The Home Secretary hits back after the government's Rwanda plan for asylum seekers is ruled unlawful. Suella Braverman didn't hold back on her thoughts on the Court of Appeal decision, which is likely to lead to even more legal chaos. There is a real risk that persons sent to Rwanda will be returned to their home countries where they faced persecution or other inhumane treatment. It is unfair on taxpayers. This is madness, Mr Speaker, and it must end. The Prime Minister has vowed to fight on despite the ruling and has made it very clear he plans to challenge the latest decision at the Supreme Court. So what does this mean for the future of these flights? Well, we'll have the details also tonight. Curfews, no public transport, 40,000 police officers deployed. France braces for more protests over the shooting dead of a teenager by an officer. Our exclusive report on Russia's private army, the Wagner Group, and its secret deal with Syria's President Assad. The UK's first lithium mine is planned for Cornwall and a boost to the electric car industry and... Three, two, one, release, release, release. Space tourism, we have liftoff. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic takes paying customers to the edge of space. This is ITV News at 10 with Charlene White. Good evening. When the appeal court ruled today that the government's contentious plan to transfer some asylum seekers to Rwanda was unlawful, one of the judges was keen to point out they decided on the evidence, not the politics. But that wasn't enough to stop the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, launching into a withering demolition demolition of those who opposed the plan. She told MPs that supporting an asylum system for people who had broken into the country was the result of what she called phony humanitarianism and madness. There is no doubt the court's ruling has punched a hole in the Rwanda plan, which still hasn't actually flown anyone to Rwanda. But Ms Braverman and the Prime Minister both made it clear they will challenge the ruling in the Supreme Court, the highest in the land. It's a policy that's never quite taken off. Deportation flights to Rwanda were grounded last year and today judges decided it still isn't safe to clear their departure. There are substantial grounds for believing that there is a real risk that persons sent to Rwanda will be returned to their home countries where they faced persecution or other inhumane treatment when in fact they have a good claim for asylum. In that sense, Rwanda is not a safe third country. With that, the Court of Appeal rose somewhat divided, but a majority found in favour of the asylum seekers and charities that brought the case. We understand that people want to stop people dying in the channel, but this isn't the way to do it. Punishing innocent child people, men, women and children, by sending them thousands of miles away in order to deter other people, it's not effective. For the government, today's court battle wasn't just about the law, but the next election. Deterring channel crossings is one of its five key pledges, and judges have ruled that promise, as it currently stands, cannot be lawfully kept. Last year, we made the trip. Others may still have to, travelling to see how refugees live in Rwanda, where the government insists they are safe. The freedoms here aren't the same as the freedoms in Britain, are they? Um, I don't know what you're talking about. We, we don't see living in Rwanda as a punishment. Today's ruling is specifically about the risk of people who've crossed the channel being sent to Rwanda, but then returned to danger in their home countries. I'm waiting for my family to join me. People like Kaveh, who came to Britain by small boat from Iran the day after the Rwanda policy was first announced. How does it feel having all this uncertainty hanging over you? It was our fault. Uh, we, we, ha we had a so, so bad time at the fairs. We heard about um, you need to go to the Rwanda, you have to go to the Rwanda because most of people want to be safe. These plans just waste money and time. 
but having visited Rwanda herself, the Home Secretary is so committed to her policy that she'll appeal. It is unfair on taxpayers who foot the hotel bill for people who've broken into this country. It incentivises mass flows of economic migration into Europe, lining the pockets of people smugglers and turning our seas into graveyards, all in the name of a phony humanitarianism. This is madness, Mr Speaker, and it must end. But tonight, asylum seekers are waiting decisions in centres like this one are stuck in a whole new level of legal limbo. Paul Brand, News at 10. Well, our deputy political editor, Anushka Astana, has joined us in the studio. So where does this leave the government's policy where Rwanda is concerned? Will we see any planes taking off? It leaves a flagship reform in a very bad place. And no, we won't see any planes take off for some time. But as you've been hearing, there is another legal step. We'll know within a week if the Supreme Court will hear this. But I almost guarantee they will because there was a split judgment today. They could hear it in the autumn with the result by December. But look, even if the government win then, individuals could still take their cases to Strasbourg. Now, critics today of this policy are really, really relieved. There are many people, even inside the Home Office, who have argued to me that there isn't much evidence that this policy will actually deter people. There are questions about value for money, Labour seizing on figures that suggest it would cost £169,000 for each removal, much more than the around £100,000 that they save. But for Conservative MPs, and I've spoken to them on all wings of the party today. They're frustrated by this judgment. They like the policy. One on the right of the party said, we should now pull out of the European Convention of Human Rights. On the left of the party, they don't want that. But one of them said to me today, this feels like judicial activism, unelected judges blocking policy. For the government, sources tell me they are disappointed, but there are positives they're holding on to with their case. Firstly, that overall, this said it is lawful to send asylum seekers to a safe third country. But on the Rwanda point specifically, they're really focused on that split judgment that the Lord Chief Justice disagreed with his colleagues. They think that gives themselves a chance in the Supreme Court. OK, we shall see. Anushka, thanks very much. A huge police presence in cities across France has not prevented a third night of angry protest. 40,000 officers are on the streets to guard against more violence after the fatal shooting of a 17-year-old in Paris. The protests, which began in the suburb of Nanterre, where the boy, identified only by his first name, Nahel, was killed, they've spread across the country. Tonight, there were clashes with police in Lille. There have also been violence in Amiens, Strasbourg, Dijon, Lyon and Toulouse. There's an awful predictability to the way demonstrations end in Paris. The police, at the slightest provocation, resort to baton charges and tear gas. Protesters, even when asked to be peaceful, come ready for the fight. Amidst the anger of the last two days, this march through the streets where an unarmed 17-year-old was shot down was never going to end well. Assassin! Assassin! Murderers, murderers, he shouts, and in present circumstances, he has a point. Even among those whose lives are rarely touched by tensions in the Paris suburbs, this week's shooting has been profoundly shocking. The mother of 17-year-old Nahel had led this march of protest and of memory from the top of a van, frequently pleading with the crowd for silence and for respect. But the cry here was, no justice, no peace. The anger goes much deeper than the death of one teenager. However tough they are on the policeman who fired the shot, and they are pretty much throwing a book at him, it is unlikely to satisfy anyone here, because what they're protesting about is not one rogue officer, but a systematic culture of police violence. They will charge the policeman who killed Nahel with murder, the government from the president downwards has been explicit in its condemnation. The anger here, though, is going to require much more. For the past few years, there have been so many like young people dead like for nothing, either dead or injured, like super injured, and it's become very dangerous because we don't want France to become like the US, you know. There are not just 
one bad police man in, uh, I don't know, in from uh, 100 police officers. There are, I think, um, the half or more than the half police officers are bad officers. Last night, the disturbances had spread beyond Paris with localised flare-ups across France. Tonight, the government will put 40,000 riot police on the streets. If they can't talk the rioters down, they will try to suppress them by sheer force of numbers. Already this evening, there have been outbreaks of trouble in the northern city of Lille. Minor by the standards of previous days, but it is early and a long night lies ahead. James Mates, News at 10. Paris. Back to events here, and if MPs don't support the machinery of Parliament, it begs the question, who will? So perhaps no wonder then that the committee that said Boris Johnson lied over lockdown parties has hit back against those it thinks tried to make their work more difficult. It's named and shamed some of his biggest supporters, including Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nadine Dorries and Dame Priti Patel. The committee says the group refused to cooperate with its inquiry and attacked its members. I don't think there was ever a world in which this committee was going to find Boris innocent. Nadine Doris defending her political hero Boris Johnson when he was being investigated for lying to Parliament by the House of Commons Privileges Committee. She wasn't the only one. The lack of accountability. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. The Privileges Committee is not even a proper legal setup. Today, that same committee said these ex-ministers were all trying to discredit it, impede its work, even force its members to resign, and it wants the power to punish them. So how anxious is Jacob Rees-Mogg that, like Boris Johnson, he could now be sanctioned? Then I shall be at the test match, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you, sir. But another MP, criticised by the committee, was less relaxed. I am disappointed to be named, uh, and I think it's, it's a bit of a sad day for free speech if I'm unable to uh, criticise a media witch hunt for fear of being named in a privileged committee report. Boris Johnson's fan club also besmirched the committee on Twitter. Andrea Jenkins, who was made a dame by Johnson, said she hoped to see him fully exonerated and to put an end to this kangaroo court. Lord Goldsmith endorsed the description of the committee as a kangaroo court, saying it was exactly this. And Brendan Clark Smith said it was a witch hunt. So the committee complained that this pressure had significant personal impact on individual members and raised significant security concerns. The leader of the House of Commons confirmed there will be a vote to give the committee the powers it wants to punish MPs who try to undermine its work. The fact that uh, a debate on it is on our, the business statement, I hope, reassures the House how seriously government takes uh, these matters. Here we are again, talking about misbehaviour of Tory MPs in the middle of a cost of living crisis. We've got a Prime Minister who's too weak to sort this out. So is the former Culture Secretary, who said she's quitting Parliament but won't say when, repentant? Uh, no. There is no committee of MPs who should be allowed to distort the truth and to, to overrule democracy in a way that this Privileges Committee but has. You know what it was an says. absolute kangaroo court. This is Boris Johnson swearing to tell the whole truth to the committee. He quit Parliament rather than take his punishment, leaving his parliamentary cheerleaders to face the possible humiliation of saying sorry to MPs for doubting the fairness of his trial. Robert Peston, News at 10. Now to an exclusive report on the Wagner Group, the private army that's been fighting against Ukraine on behalf of Russia. We've learned that less than two weeks before its soldiers started marching towards Moscow, Syria's President Assad, who has relied on President Putin's forces in his civil war against his own people, was negotiating with Wagner. The President Assad wanted a tenfold increase in the number of Wagner fighters operating in Syria. Our security editor Rohit uncovered the deal and is here, Rohit. Well, Charlene, these conversations were happening earlier this month, that recently. Conversations to make Syria the biggest Wagner base uh, anywhere in the world. And when that march to Moscow began, the Syrian regime were completely blindsided. I guess it shows how surprising that attempted coup was even to Wagner's closest partners. Now, 
These are the details. Just two weeks before these scenes in Russia, Wagner's men in Damascus were talking to the Syrian regime about a lucrative deal to recruit tens of thousands of new fighters. Wagner's forces in Syria have uh, for years numbered around uh, three, four, five thousand troops, but a deal was being discussed to increase that many fold to 70,000 troops. Now, in the talks, the regime insisted that half those fighters would be made uh, to stay in Syria for developments there, but half could be sent to any of the countries where Wagner operates around the world. Now, here's where the process began. Azad visiting Putin in, in Moscow in March, where he said this. We believe that if Russia has the desire to expand bases or increase their number, it is a technical or logistical issue. Sounds like a vague commitment, doesn't it? But in private, they actually shook hands on making Russia's presence in Syria permanent and adding to the number of bases in Syria where they already have a temporary presence. Wagner Group came to Syria not long after Russia's intervention in 2015. Putin's men and Prigorin's men working hand in hand to tip the balance of the civil war in favor of Assad. And thanks to that, he's still in power, despite all the atrocities, despite the chemical weapons, despite the corruption, the bloodshed and the hunger. But we can reveal for the first time the scale of Prigorin's role inside Syria away from the battlefield. We've learned that it was he who organized this so-called uh, peace summit for Syria in Sochi in 2018. 1,500 delegates turned up, many boycotted. Prigorin stayed in the background. What's in this for him beyond influence? Well, this presidential decree might help explain that. A lucrative contract in 2019 to allow oil exploration and drilling with a mysterious company called Mercury. What wasn't widely known at the time was that Prigorin uh, had a key role in that company, part of why the company was actually sanctioned by the UK and others three weeks later. Now, this is business to him, Charlene, but as ever in Syria, you know, it's the people who suffer uh, the most. Just this week, Russian airstrike killed at least nine civilians uh, in a marketplace. Uh, and all the while, this normalization process continues uh, Assad being welcomed back onto the world stage by many countries in the region. Well, can I just bring you um, to events in, in Ukraine with those um, uh, Wagner mercenaries uh, saying they won't fight in Ukraine anymore. What does that mean um, for the conflict? Well, this is about contracts. Uh, uh, Wagner refused to sign a contract with the Prem Kremlin, which would basically transfer their people and some of their resources uh, to the Russian armed forces. Now, what does this mean? Some of those uh, Wagner fighters will simply join the uh, Russian army independently. Many won't. So it reduces their number. But it's possible to overstate the scale and the importance of this mercenary group. You know, on the front line in Ukraine, in terms of numbers, in terms of a material presence, they're not huge. OK. Rohit, thanks very much for talking us through that. It was the turn of Nicola Sturgeon, the former First Minister of Scotland, to explain the lack of preparations for a pandemic. She said all the focus had been on flu. Dealing with other inf infectious disease had been thought about, she said, but nothing was ever put down in writing. Ms Sturgeon told the inquiry she deeply regrets having to divert resources from emergency planning to prepare for the possibility of a no-deal Brexit. That prompted the inquiry lawyer to remind her that she was speaking from a witness box, not a soap box. It goes without saying that the name of the secret police unit, the Special Demonstration Squad, wasn't very well known, but its 1970s and 80s spying exploits became infamous. Now, a public inquiry has found that Scotland Yard should have shut down the unit in the first years of, of its investigations into left-wing groups. Its undercover police officers tricked women into sexual relationships, used the names of dead babies and spied on the family of Stephen Lawrence. The report said its methods weren't justified and only three of the groups it spied on were legitimate targets. 
If targets on electric car sales are to be hit, the batteries for those built in the UK will have to come from somewhere. So today we found out where the lithium for those batteries will be extracted will be in Cornwall. The first lithium mine in the country will produce enough of the stuff for half a million cars a year. In a clay quarry near St Austell, the scramble for one of the world's economically essential minerals is underway. Cornwall has the geology, British lithium, the technology and now the funding. The transition to net zero will be driven by lithium iron batteries, an industry that China dominates. So we need to catch up. Europe is investing a lot, the UK is investing a lot, so we are catching up. We have to do that fast, rapidly, because the world is moving and we don't want to lose this race. This is what companies and governments around the world want to secure supplies of, lithium carbonate, extracted from Cornish granite using a process we're told will be profitable and environmentally low risk. Imerus estimates the UK's first lithium mine will produce 20,000 tonnes of battery grade lithium a year by the end of the decade. Lithium production in Australia, China and Chile last year was on an altogether bigger scale, but 20,000 tonnes is significant. That's enough to build 500,000 electric vehicle batteries a year. The electric car revolution is underway. The British car industry is trying to adapt, but without British built car batteries, it will struggle. Two hours by car from St Austell is Bridgewater, where Tata Motors, which owns Jaguar Land Rover, is expected to soon confirm plans to build a battery factory. By locating here, Jaguar Land Rover would potentially have access to a supply of lithium on its doorstep. Now, the UK is never going to be able to mine enough lithium to support the current level of car production, but it makes sense to be as self-sufficient as possible. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine have shown us just how fragile global supply chains can be. Five million pounds of government money helped to get this project going. The United States, though, is offering subsidies worth hundreds of billions of pounds to firms to extract critical minerals and build batteries. The European Union has similar ambition and deep pockets. Britain has been slow and it brings in the bigger agenda of Europe because we used to do most of our critical minerals work actually through the European Union. And it's only recently, only last year, that we had our own critical mineral strategy and so we, we are playing catch up from, from that respect. Tonight, a spokesperson for the government told us it had worked closely with the EU since Brexit and that many existing agreements had been rolled over. Cornwall is dotted with reminders of its mining heritage. The tin and copper shafts closed long ago, but in St Austell, a revival is underway and it's one we should all be interested in. John Hills, News at 10 in Cornwall. The Queen was known for being frugal and it seems as though the King is following in her footsteps and trying to keep heating costs and emissions down at Buckingham Palace. With thermostats now being set at 19 degrees, but the latest royal accounts show overall spending is up 5%, partly because the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations and her funeral fell in the same financial year. No one needs reminding what a year of change it was for the royal family. This time last year, the country had just marked the late Queen's historic Platinum Jubilee. And then, in September, the world looked on as the family and country said goodbye to its longest reigning monarch. Today, the palace described the last year as exceptional, and it said it partly explains the increase in spending from the publicly funded pot of money which pays for the work of the royal family, known as the Sovereign Grant. The royal family spent £107.5 million last year, a 5% increase on the year before. The Queen's Platinum Jubilee added 700000 to royal expenditure and the funeral another £1.6 million. But last year's sovereign grant was frozen at £86.3 million. To plug the gap, the palace had to take almost £21 million from its reserves and cut back maintenance on other properties. The King has also ordered the heating is turned down across the royal estate. Occupied rooms can't be hotter than 19 Celsius, unoccupied rooms 16 Celsius. I think the idea of him turning down the heating uh, in Buckingham Palace is just a bad joke. I think there's a lot of people that cannot afford to heat their homes at all 
There are a lot of people that can't afford to have a home at all. And, uh, you know, they're still spending, uh, you know, well over £300 million a year of our money that should be going to local services. Following a race row at a palace reception last year when an aide kept asking a guest where she came from, the Royals want 14% of its staff to be from diverse backgrounds, but progress has stalled at 9.7%, the same proportion as the year before. As for Harry and Meghan, the palace today confirmed they have packed up and left Frogmore Cottage for good. The Windsor property was supposed to be the Sussexes' UK base, even after they left for California. But the house now stands empty. The King and Queen continued their charity work last night. They've promised to keep a lid on costs and even royal finances are not immune from the soaring rate of inflation. We won't know for sure what this new king plans to do with royal finances until this time next year because these accounts relate to a period of huge change. They span two reigns and the first state funeral of a monarch since 1952. One thing we do know, however, is that Harry and Meghan have moved out of Frogmore Cottage and that means they don't intend to spend very much time, if any, in Harry's country of birth. Chris Ship, News at 10, Buckingham Palace. Let's move on to sport now. And England's cricketers made more of a fight on day two, the second Ashes test. Uh, they eventually got Australia's Steve Smith out this morning. But only after it hit 110, Australia were all out for 416. When Australia started bowling, they lost their best spinner, Nathan Lyon, to a calf injury while he was fielding. Ben Duckett was England's top scorer. He made 98, helping England to 278 for four. That cut Australia's lead to 138, so all to play for tomorrow. Supermodel Naomi Campbell has become a mum for a second time. The 53-year-old shared this photo on social media, saying her baby boy was a true gift from God, adding it's never too late to become a mother. Ms Campbell already has a daughter who was born two years ago. A huge congratulations. Right then, finally. Sir Richard Branson's long-held dream of operating commercial flights to the edge of space is almost upon us. A Virgin Galactic trip took off from the spaceport in New Mexico today with two Italian Air Force officers and an aero engineer on board. Next time, it'll be paying passengers who'll have a ticket to ride. Today will be our sixth space flight and the start of our commercial service. This was billed as the first commercial space flight for Virgin Galactic, setting the stage for tourists to follow. Predicted apogee today is 275,000 feet. It took to the skies from a spaceport in New Mexico. Three, two, one, release, release, release. The spacecraft attaching flawlessly from the mothership. Good control. And heading straight up. Set. We're now traveling at approximately Mach 1.4. The trim is complete and Unity is in the vertical headed towards space. Having reached an altitude Mach of over 50 miles, these first time astronauts could enjoy their few minutes of being weightless. Our mission specialists have been cleared to unstrap and enjoy the zero G experience. This is the passengers amazing. on this trip were Italian Air Force pilots. Is, uh, Colonel Villa Day going Quick to, to the show some national pride. And viva la Italia! <laughs> and welcome to space, astronauts. How absolutely The next group will be tourists been paying three hundred and fifty thousand pounds for a seat. Congratulations to one. For Virgin Galactic, this has been an arduous journey punctuated by tragedy nine years ago, when human error led to the destruction of a spacecraft and the death of a pilot. We're at 61,000 feet now, continuing to descend in the feathered configuration. When we get but in the end, the company bounced back, and today's flight and safe return will be seen as an affirmation of the technology. It was a beautiful uh, ride. You can uh, be told about, during the training, which kind of experiences you may have. But in the end, when it's your body and your senses are feeling, it's completely different. <laughs> we also had the opportunity to look outside and uh, really enjoy the beauty of the view outside. Main gear touchdown. Now Virgin Galactic has a product ready for the tourist market, even if the cost of a ride to space for now will be out of reach for all but the wealthiest travelers. And there's will stop.
Robert Moore News at 10 in the United States. Oh, my goodness. Wow, hugely impressive. Okay, that's it from us for tonight. For tonight, all of us here. Bye-bye.